Welcome to the Run Shoot Diaries podcast. This is where we talk about managing your time in ways that helps you accomplish your running goals. Lace up to get your race up. Let's get moving. Hey, hey, what's up, everybody out there running on native land? And welcome to the Run Shoot Diaries podcast. I'm your host, Luis, a.k.a. Chico, and this is Season 2, Episode 2, Making It Broadcast Number 12. Thank you for spending some of your precious time listening to the show. I appreciate it. I'm definitely not going to waste it. Lace up to get your race up and let's get moving. We're at the starting line with this episode's guest, and he is definitely an all-around athlete. From cycling to powerlifting and everything in between, this man has attempted it all. He is the definition of never stop improving, and if there's an award for consistency, this man deserves that award. Please join me in welcoming to the Run Shoe Diaries podcast, Richard James III. Hey. How's it going, buddy? It's going great. That is awesome. Is that what I think it is? It is. (laughs) That's amazing. (laughs) Oh, man. So let's hold off on that so I can work that into the question because I got to start off this episode with this question here. Richard, have you ever watched the 1994 animated Disney movie titled The Lion King? Yes. Well, there's a part in that movie where Timon says to Pumbaa, it starts, you think you know a guy. And I think that this is going to be the theme for that right there. (laughs) So, Richard, welcome to the show. Let's kick this off with the Fast Five. These are five rapid fire questions that will give us some quick insight about you. Let's go. Question number one. When it comes to running, do you prefer roads or trails? Trails, simply because I love the outdoor, the nature. Uh, roads become monotonous after a while. I don't know if we need to expand on these questions or <laughs> yes or no, but no, trails it is. Yo, I, I agree with that one. <laughs> Question number two, medals, buckles, or challenge coins? Uh, and since I hosted events as well as participating in them and know how difficult it is to have the correct number of items to meet everyone's what they everybody has their own preference and yeah. everybody has a good reason for their preference. You know, some people just have too many medals. Some people find a belt buckle more versatile. They can wear it out and show it off more frequently. Yeah, um, I really don't have a preference. I, it's the memory of the event oh, that stays nice. with me. So it, it, it's uh all the little intricacies of that event that make it special. Yeah. Like, for instance, we mentioned trails at the beginning. It could just be something as scenic as the surroundings, the environment around you during the run that just lasts forever, much longer than that metal that you throw into a drawer somewhere or a box in storage. So <laughs> yes. I'd have to say I don't really have a preference. Uh, I mean, I've received some cool things through the years. Yeah. And at the moment, it's like, wow, that's neat. But if you think back to it you can't recall where some of those came from you're like what year was this metal yep (laughs) here was this buckle i don't remember but you remember the event if you think back to you know the trail or or something that occurred during the event or struggle you overcame so it's the experience for me so a picture that pops up in my memories on facebook or instagram or something like that is more valuable than than some metal or buckle or something token earned at the event I love that. And I'm going to add experience to that question right there because that's just something that, I mean, we often forget about and everything. Fast five, question number three. Besides athletics, what is your favorite pastime? Uh, for me, it's it's movies. Uh, I love watching movies and getting escaping into it because I've written a children's book series and hope to one day launch my own animated series and movie yeah. based on that book series and the trading card game I created. So, and I know for kids, it's the best way to learn because if you link an experience to your imagination, it becomes a long-term memory and uh, escapism into that movie environment. It just frees the mind and you can really explore new opportunities, learn new things. And so uh, I, I, yeah. I do enjoy that. Nice. Number four, what is some advice that you would give to your younger self? Uh, slow down. <laughs> yes. And, and that's uh, with everything. It's, it's uh, overtrained, trained too much, started races too fast, uh, tried to lift too much too fast. It doesn't matter what it is. When you're younger, you really think you have to do it now. You have to do it faster. But smooth and controlled 
ends up being faster, staying within your limits, staying right below that threshold, learning where your threshold is. And because it constantly changes depending on your fueling, your whether you're hydrated, the stress in your life. But if you can learn to recognize that threshold for that day, for that event and stay within it, you'll have much more success as far as a quality workout and then recovering faster to do another quality workout instead of just depleting yourself and not being able to work out for a week again yeah. with quality. Richard, you're kicking this podcast butt right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't preview these questions, so this is just off the top of my head. <laughs> I love it. All right, fast five, question number five. What is something positive happening in your life right now? Ah, uh, there's so, I mean, for me right now at this moment is my strength. I'm almost 50 years old. I'll be 50 this year, but my strength continues to increase. And I'm, it's just amazes me. Uh, I mean, I've consistency is the key, but uh, you go through cycles where you gain a little strength, lose a little strength in your workouts. But for right now, for whatever reason, uh, several different factors, uh, one of the keys being slow down, leave a few reps in the tank when you work out. We can talk more into that later. Yeah. But uh, it's it's uh, my strength continues to tick upward and it's just thrilling. It's amazing. And strength is more important and valuable as you age. As we all know, we lose strength with age. So to be able to continue to get stronger as I get older, it, it's a, a blessing yeah. and, and amazing. Dude, this is awesome. Hey, that was the Fast Five. Thank you for those answers. Now let's kick this podcast off. Richard, go ahead and give us your introduction. Introduce myself? Oh my yes. gosh. Yeah. That's a... <laughs> I'm just a, an average Joe who tries many different things. Uh, I don't know. Going back, I, I was born in Mississippi. Uh, like, like we talked about before. Um, one connection, I learned that my grandmother was Choctaw Indian, because I know you're yes. speak to that. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I'm a Heinz 57 personally, so but uh, do have that in my in my genealogy. Um, I was born in Mississippi, grew up in Beaumont, Texas, uh, valedictorian of my high school class, have a degree in biomedical engineering, uh, took the entrepreneurial plunge, have written a children's book series entitled Adventures of the Elements that teaches about chemistry and science. It's a story about kids that find sunglasses and through them, they can see the elements from the periodic table. However, those elements are personifying the superhero like characters that battle evil molecules, uh, you know, save the world. You learn yeah. life lessons through the stories, that type of thing. Um, I've founded a couple of nonprofit organizations, uh, Fit Lab Foundation, where we have our gym, Sports yeah. Society for American Health. We've hosted over 40 events, uh, triathlons, bicycle races, speed skating races marathon the gusher marathon for years um 5ks etc um i've done pretty much every sporting event there is i used to compete <laughs> yeah. at the olympic level and speed skating um i've done marathons 5ks ultra marathons bicycle races triathlons <laughs> uh, crossfit competitions powerlifting yeah. competitions uh have set three world records in powerlifting uh, wow. just this past year yeah uh, carried the Olympic tor torch since it is the Olympics. Um, <laughs> this was for the 2002 Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City, Utah. Yeah, that, that was uh, that's my highlight as far as all accomplishments in sports. Being able to carry the <laughs> Olympic torch meant the most to me. Wow. So, uh, that's uh, uh, all right, Richard, let's start back at your childhood age. Do you have any siblings? Um, and if so, where do you fit in there? Yes, I'm the oldest of five. I have oldest three sisters. Of five. Yes, three sisters and a brother. My brother's second in line, and then I have three younger sisters. They're all grown now, of course, but yeah, yes, five of us. So you and I were talking recently, and you just mentioned it, but your great-grandmother was of indigenous descent, and you said that was Choctaw? Yes. How old were you when you found out this information? Um, I've known my entire life because my grandmother spoke about, you know, her grandmother and, and mother and everything. Yeah. But um, I didn't know what uh, I always got confused as to what um, line my, my dad looks. He whenever we've gone to Alabama Cachada stuff and I was in Boy Scouts and the Order of the Arrow and everything. Yeah. And, and so uh, we did several indigenous uh, culture things through that. 
And they always thought my dad was Native American because he has a little dark (laughs) hair. They'd come up and speak to him in Cherokee or anything, and (laughs) he just (laughs) stared at him, no, I don't speak. (laughs) So, um, yeah, I've known my entire life that that did have um, those roots. Okay. Uh, You don't, by chance, have any stories of your lineage or anything, do you? I don't, unfortunately. From what I understand, I think, and I can't be 100% sure about that, either my her dad was a, a chief okay. um, but that's about all i know that that is amazing you know and i've i've never done this before but i'm semi interested in what my results would reveal if i was to do one of the uh, ancestry dna tests right that's <laughs> what my mom did and that's the reason i okay. know okay i know i know it all right you mentioned uh you were in boy scouts you were an eagle scout for troop 85 yes Okay, was this located in Beaumont? It is, it's in Beaumont. Okay, for those of us that don't know, can you give us a bit of background information on what a Eagle Scout is? Sure, um, you enter Boy Scouts and basically you have to, there's several ranks, starts at Scout, Tenderfoot, works your way up through life and into Eagle. Um, it takes many years because you have to earn so many merit badges such okay. as um, Wilderness Survival, where you actually sleep overnight in the woods with nothing. Um, wow. there, there's several skills you learn, not tying, all the stuff you hear about Boy Scouts. Yeah. But there's all sorts of different skills you have to complete and master in order to advance to the next rank. Okay. And then eventually you become an Eagle Scout. Um, you have to do service projects once you reach the star level because it goes star life and Eagle. And okay. uh, so you have to complete community service projects that you spearhead. A lot of leadership you have to undertake, uh, leading patrols and different things like that in, in the scouts. Oh, okay. um, there's summer camps, lots of camping. Um, so, yes, yeah, so you go through a progression. Very few make it to Eagle because it does oh, take wow. a lot of work. Yeah, it's, I think the figure might be one out of 100 or two out of 100 boys ever make it to Eagle Scout. Um, wow. That's why the military gives you a rank boost instantly if you are an eagle scout uh, it's always been that way uh, really it's looked favorably upon by universities or, yeah. or uh, a lot of recruiters with employment um wow. you know i really a moral, I, moral code of ethics you have to follow etc wow i i really did not know that and so my next question was and i kind of think you answered it with that was if you're an Eagle Scout, are you an Eagle Scout for life or just you are. membership yes, for, life? for life? Wow. Well, congratulations on that. Oh, thank you. You soar with the Eagles for life. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, and that that goes right along with the theme that I mentioned earlier. It's like, oh, you think you know a guy. <laughs> <laughs> so I was reading a study titled Merit Beyond the Badge, and it found that Eagle Scouts are more likely to participate in outdoor recreational activities more goal oriented and be in leadership positions, whether that be in your workplace or in the community. And again, this is going to be a common theme that we keep seeing and hearing throughout this conversation. Very true. Most Eagles I know are that they're business owners. They, of course, you, you spend a lot of time camping, everything. So you learn the value of the outdoors and to appreciate it and enjoy it and conservation minded. Uh, so yes, uh, you always when you go into a campsite, you leave it as you found it. You know, yeah. make steps to improve the environment. You know, just through that few questions that I asked about Eagle Scouts, well, Boy Scouts in particular, I have a greater respect for that whole thought now, that whole organization. So yes. thank you for that. So let's talk education. You mentioned before you were the valedictorian of your high school. Correct. Uh, what year and high school was that? It was 1991 in Central High School in Beaumont, Texas. All right. What was what was the song that? Uh, what was the cool song at that time? Do you remember by chance? Uh, I know one of our songs was "Boys to Men," and I can't remember the name of the song now. <laughs> nice, but <Yeah>. yes. <laughs> but thereafter, you attended uh, Louisiana Tech University, and you studied biomedical engineering. Correct. And for yeah, those they, who don't know, is biomedical engineering is engineering anything that can be assigned to a human body from artificial, you know, limbs, organs to ergonomically designed car seat, uh, seats. Wow. I actually went to uh, help design astronaut spacesuits at one point, um, uh, designing 
anything that can be uh, applicable to the human body. It can be surgical tools, um, running a hospital. Some do that. Um, wow. So it's, it's a very diverse field. Yeah, I was reading the description on the Louisiana Tech website, and it states that that field of study also includes, well, of course, everything that you mentioned, but the things that stood out to me was rehab engineering, nanoscience, biomicro, and nano devices. Yes, so, nanotechnology is a huge part of it. Um, and designing, you know, robotics for the future, instead of having to cut you open for surgery, yeah. you can swallow a pill and then the nano robot is inside of you. It's so small and it can, you know, make the repairs within different valves and things like that. So yeah. the future for medicine, it's, if you look at the potential for the future, it's very barbaric the way we approach medicine today. It'll be looked on <laughs> the comparison between the way they did surgery during Civil War or World War One times compared yeah. to the way they do it now is going to be the same evolution to the future. So a lot less invasive. Um, yeah. You won't be as fearful going in. Yeah, so it, it's wonderful, the possibilities. Heck yeah. Hey, so th through my research of Mr. Richard James the Third. Uh, the reason that those areas jumped out to me is because they seem to have some connection with Alchemy Creative Incorporated, which is something that you are currently the president of. Yes, that's the company I founded um, that we took public uh, years ago to yeah. raise the funds for the Adventures Elements animation. We have half of the movies complete, so we're working oh with the investors God. to try to finish the the funding of the movie. Um, I can actually share this. Bill and Melinda Gates actually invested in a little bit in it. But wow. um, unfortunately, none of that money's gone into my pockets. It's all gone towards the development. And we're still, like I tell people, think of it like Pixar makes a movie. If it costs, a, let's say, $100 million to keep the math simple and they only get $50 million, they're still $50 million short. No one's made anything yet in the movie. Right. So that's kind of the stage we're at. Um, the first animatics completed, I have it on my YouTube, which is basically like a flipbook version of the movie it's a bunch of hand-drawn illustrations with the voiceovers and uh, okay. the pictures going through uh, kids still enjoy it which is great to see um it's entitled the water cycle so you learn about the water cycle and uh other chemistry stuff as well but, but um we're doing it in dallas with a studio there and uh okay actually talk to warner brothers and if we can finish it they're interested in distribution so wow. it's a, a very lengthy long difficult, arduous <laughs> process. <laughs> and uh, it all depends on whether or not we can find more uh, investors. Uh, yeah, and with definitely. Alchemy Creative, we have uh, are in talks with some nanotechnology companies as well with another branch of the company of our company. So yeah, fingers crossed we can make some advancement with that because that takes me back to my biomedical engineering roots and okay. some of the amazing potential with nanotechnology. Uh, so today. what is uh, Alchemy Alchemy Creative. Am I saying this right? Alchemy. Yes, that's it. Okay. How, what What is the whole venture itself like? What What is it? Do it, it's just a, a corporation. Okay, and yeah, that, a publicly and, traded corporation. Yes. Okay, and I just want to make sure because yeah, through my research, I was just like make connecting. I was playing connect the dots with uh, <laughs> Richard's life here, and I was just like, oh my god, there's this and there's this. <laughs> yeah, so it is really amazing. But right now, Richard, we are developing this knowledge base of you as a person. So before we get into, get into your athletic accomplishments and your future athletic goals, because I know there are some, let me rattle off these three interesting Richard facts. And uh -oh. you, exp you explain these facts and or tell us the underlying story behind them. So this one you've already spoken to, but fact number one, you are the author of a book series. And again, you think you know a guy. <laughs> but you you had mentioned that you have uh, also created a trading card game with them. Excuse yes. me. <laughs> it's like I squeaked on it. Wow, there it is. That's the first book in the series. Okay. Adventures of the Elements, second book, and the third book. Wow. There are four books. I haven't released the fourth one yet. It is completed. And of course, numerous scripts as well uh, for the movies and the anime okay. series. But, that's uh, amazing. Yeah, that's the, the books. And this is one of the trading cards. <laughs> Just, oh, wow. So that's Felix Ferrum, um, Iron, 
And uh, I'm actually creating NFTs of these at the moment. So dabbling okay. into that a little bit. Yeah. So go ahead with your next. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where you're headed. So I, I want to go back in the story just a little bit because I want to say I think I met you in 2017. And that was right after Hurricane Harvey and everything, I believe. Yes. Uh, all of this up until now, everything that we talked about in this podcast is all brand new information to me. Oh, wow. Yes. yes. I, I don't think I ever talked about it. <laughs> no, but it's funny because the uh, last episode, uh, Jessica, Jessica Bakari, she just released her book as well. And then it just so happens that, you know, you released your book and everything. And writing a book was always something that I've wanted to do. Uh, I've always just kind of like put it off. But how much time does it take uh, somebody to write a book, I guess? It if you can speak the, to that. It depends on the individual. It really ranges. I mean, you have someone like Stephen King that just is amazing how fast he turns out a book. Um, it uh, For me, the books almost write themselves in a sense because I let the characters take it. Okay. I sometimes back myself into a corner. I don't always know where the book is headed. Some people outline the entire book and they know where it's going. Yeah. I tend to not do that because I like to get myself sometimes trapped in a situation and have to figure it out because it makes a more interesting story sometimes. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so it depends on the individual and how much time you have to dedicate toward it. When I wrote the first book, I actually spent did nothing else for a whole month and just oh, wrote wow. on the book. So I finished it much more quickly than someone that, you know, is, has a full time job and is having to do it on weekends or yeah. whenever they have a spare moment. And uh, I found that just like, you know, with long distance running or cycling, that's your best thinking time a lot of times. Yes. And so if you get writer's block, go for a run. A lot of times <laughs> as you're running, ideas are going to pop into your head and you're like, oh, and you can't wait to get back and write. You just hope you don't forget about <laughs> time to get back. But now with cell phones, you yeah. can always just make a note. Um, and so when you return, you're refreshed and fired up and ready to go on instead of just sitting there staring at a keyboard and blank screen for three hours. Yeah. I always tell people, get writer's block, go out for your run or work out or do something right. and then come back to it. And a lot of times you'll be able to advance further. So a lot of times people get trapped because they're like, Oh, I don't know what I'm gonna write next. I go, do you know how it's going to end? And they're like, yeah. I go, we'll write that fantastic ending that you have an idea for. And then you just have to figure out the bridge to get yeah. to that point. Heck so yeah. you always have to go in order. And when you edit, you're going to go back and chop things up anyway. Yeah. And splice things together and make changes. So don't get trapped just because you don't know what the next sentence is supposed to be. Move on. Come back to it. Heck yeah. That is awesome. Do you have any new characters in development or anything? Every single time. I mean, there's over 120 elements and yeah. carbon alone makes over a million molecules. So there's basically no end to the potential characters. And since everything around us is comprised of atoms, yeah. then anything you look at, anything that happens in a story, a new element, a new atom, a new molecule can emerge depending on how the story is moving. Uh, the latest one I just did is entitled The Vitamin Kingdom. So it's on vitamins and minerals. Yeah. And, uh, so it's, you know tons and tons of characters there that is amazing richard and that was only fact number one yeah. <laughs> fact number two and for the listeners this is what i was referring to at the beginning of the uh, podcast but you carried the olympic torch for the 2002 salt lake city winter olympics yes and you said that that was the highlight of everything that you have accomplished it is. I, I've loved the Olympics since I was a little kid and yeah. speed skating and everything. So to be even involved at this level was just overwhelming. And I did not realize how much was involved in the carrying the torch process. First, yeah. you had to be nominated by okay. someone. And uh, I found out later my sister had nominated me, sent in my story and everything. Because wow. one day in the mail, I just received a letter saying, you've been selected to be a bearer of the Olympic torch. And I was like, Oh my gosh, how does this even happen? I didn't send anything in. Yeah. But, uh, so once you receive that, you just don't all of a sudden carry the torch. We actually were sent to Houston. You're sent to the largest city near you, which is okay. Houston. Yeah. And you spend an entire day. There's an etiquette school you go through. They wow. size you for your clothes. You're going to wear. you learn about the history of the torch. You learn that, okay, the flame, as we all know, comes from Greece, but what happens if it goes out? Yeah. Well, what I didn't know 
is that there are Marines running behind you and one of them is carrying an extra flame. Should something happen, should someone drop a torch or oh, it's extinguished okay. for some reason, then they relight it from that flame. So it's still the flame from the Greek torch. Oh. So there, there's a security team behind you. They're all in normal clothes. You don't know it if you don't realize this. Yeah. And, uh, so they can relight the torch and it's still the same flame being carried across. But uh, there's so much history, even the design of the torch. For instance, this one, this is the the new and the old coming together so two different types of metals oh, but the wow. entire torch means something and it's, yeah. it's it has its own unique design this one's similar to ice and everything but um yeah it's it's amazing richard is this uh that opportunity is that tied to your uh your speed skating at the junior olympic level Yes, it, it was partly to that, but also had to do with I had founded a nonprofit organization, and hosted events. But um, okay. the other side of it was overcoming. Uh, I was struck by a vehicle while training for uh, in speed skating oh, and wow. it shattered my leg. And they told me they'd have to amputate my leg. I still have a rod and screws in it to this day. Wow. But the doctor said we can try some experimental surgeries and see what happens. I spent half a month in the hospital, three surgeries. Uh, they told me I'd be lucky to walk in a year. Um, don't know if you'll walk normally again, but I rehabbed myself, went back to the gym, started working out. In six months, I competed in a national speed skating race. Wow. So that, that's a truncated version of the story. It was extremely painful. <laughs> I don't ever want to go through that process again. But That's uh, amazing. Yeah, I made a full recovery. The only thing that took a year was I could not move my big toe. And every okay. day I would manually move it. They told me yeah. to have to splint it eventually because it would just curl. And then one day <laughs> it just moved on its own. I was ecstatic. It took about Heck a year. Yeah. So that is the part that took a year. But I was back to skating and working out fully by then. But, that uh, is yeah, amazing. So it, it's a whole mix of things, you know, yeah. the academics, uh, yeah, biomedical engineering background, everything. They, they look at the full picture. I yeah. know the individual I handed off to. Uh, was burned over 96 percent of his body and had survived oh. An incredible story so yeah a lot of the bearers of the olympic torch their stories are just unbelievable um wow so yeah that that's awesome I, i'm i'm happy that you you know recovered and everything and no me knowing you personally uh again you think you know a guy you know <laughs> <laughs> but your your drive is just uh, amazing. Well, We're that's why get... I always tell tell people: no matter how fit you are, you're going through your own recovery right now. Yeah, um, uh, people always go when they're first starting out. Oh, I can't do this. I go: no matter how fit you ever become, life has setbacks. So don't get stuck on a number or I can run this fast or I can do this many miles because life may set you back. You just have to deal with wherever you are in your life at that moment. Run the mile you're in. So, yeah. you know, just do what you can. Like, for instance, when I started recovering with my leg, I couldn't do anything with my leg at all. But I could work my upper body. Nothing was wrong with my upper body. So that's why I started rehabbing and then doing one-legged exercises until I could move my leg. And so uh, okay. it's just do what you can because it does cause the hormonal release and the uh, anabolic state in the body. So it is benefit to the wounded site by staying active and doing what you can. Yeah. So... Uh, so uh, a qu uh, couple questions real quick about the torch. Um, is it heavy? It has a little weight because it has, it's metal, it's solid. It's at the gym, so you can actually hold it the next time you're here. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but there's a canister inside with the, with the fuel. So it's, uh, that's okay. the thing that gives it weight. And the top is glass. So oh, it's, uh, wow. It has and a little weight to it. Did you, how far did you have to run with that? That's a good question. A lot of people think, oh, you run forever, but they have so many torchbearers and they want as many people as possible to be able to participate in the experience. Yeah. But you typically only run less than a quarter mile for most people. Wow. And I was the first person, because there are some places you cannot run. Uh -huh. When the torch came to Beaumont from Louisiana, there was a cauldron on the front of a train that was lit up, an entire flame. And so I was the first person in Beaumont on that leg. So I went up to okay. the train, and lit the torch from the train, the torch I held, and started the run. So I actually ran a little further, maybe half a mile, um, because I, I had the lighting from the train. Oh, wow. That's amazing. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So talking about the 2002 Winter Olympics, um, 
my military unit was ordered to be present at those Olympics uh, because of the heightened security at the time in the nation. You know, it was five right. months after 9-11, the events of 9-11. Yes. So one of our tasks was to monitor the spectators coming into the venues and everything. And uh, if they would set off the metal detectors, they would go to a secondary check, which is uh, soldiers wanding them down and, you know, giving them the pat and everything. So I was doing my thing. I was wanding people. And Bob Saget, rest in peace, walks up. <laughs> and I'm just this kid. And I have this huge smile on my face. And so... Bob Saget walks up and I'm trying not to be starstruck or anything, but he walks up to me and he says, stop that. It's too cold to be smiling. And so I'm trying to remain as professional as I can. And I say, yes, sir. And so I start doing, wanding him and he's like, I'm kidding. Smiling is good for the world and the world can use a little bit more smiles. And that is my heartwarming store of Bob Saget. It is, uh, and it's funny because uh, it finally I finally get to tell it because you got to carry the torch. <laughs> wow, what a connection. <laughs> <You're> right? <laughs> All right, so that was fact number two. Let's move on to fact number three. You received the Hometown Hero Award and the key to the city of Beaumont. Richard, <laughs> you think you know a guy. <laughs> Who, what, when, where, how, and why? I mean, you're doing so much amazing things. Can you speak to these accolades? Uh, yeah, I, the key to the city was actually my when I was in high school. Uh, what? Receiving that. Yes, <laughs> the key to the city of Beaumont um, was the service above self award from the Rotary Club and key to the city of Beaumont uh, for all of the numerous things we were doing at the time. Uh, I don't remember what specific reason. I, I do remember two other individuals were selected with me and yeah. all three of us, we had to speak. They brought everyone to the civic center in Beaumont and we had to give a speech to every high school person in Beaumont at that time about, wow. um, you know, just trying to be the best that you can be in everything. Yeah. Uh, That's amazing. Yeah. The hometown hero goes back to, uh, uh, hosting all the events that we did through the years. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and bringing attention to Beaumont, bringing people here, uh, yeah. improving the community, everything, everything the run run events did for that, the area. That is awesome, Richard. Hey, so let's switch up gears. And now we, let's start talking with the athletic side of Richard. And let's begin with your nonprofit organization. What is it? How did all of that begin? Sure. Uh, well, the first one, Sports Society for American Health, started back in the year 2000. Uh, with two friends of mine, uh, Mike O'Keefe, who is still with us <laughs> as okay. a safety director and everything, and Ray Solis, who has moved on to Colorado. But uh, at that time, there were Ray was doing triathlons. I was speed skating, and we were both cycling, doing cycling races. And there was nothing in that in this area happening like that. There, yeah. nowhere that you went, you couldn't find cyclists and triathletes and everything. So we formed our own community of athletes started training people, teaching them the sport and then hosting the event. Uh, of course, wow. taking it a step further, we made sure it was professionally sanctioned, uh, attracted athletes from all over. Uh, through the years we've had uh, gold medalists compete, uh, Chad Hedricks competed here in the speed skating. Wow. Um, we've had wow. several esteemed gold medalist cyclists come in for our cycling races. We held a, a two day, three stage cycling race here for quite a, for about three years, four years. Oh, wow. Uh, in Beaumont. So you would have the, the long road race section, then you had a time trial. And then the second day was a criterium through downtown Beaumont, which is a one mile course that yeah. makes laps. Um, uh, okay. So that was very exciting, very spectator friendly. And then we moved on, uh, hosted a triathlon, of course, for several years, and, and then hosted the Gusher Marathon, uh, yeah. Pleasure Island Bridge Half Marathon, Sabine Causeway 5K. Um, Daisies and Dragons duathlon for kids, uh, Iron Games, a strongman event, CrossFit competition, uh, Olympic weightlifting, powerlifting competition. Um, so pretty much the gamut uh, of all those yeah. sports. And then uh, Fit Lab Foundation. We currently have Fit Lab over on Twin City Highway in Nederland, Texas, uh, just on the outskirts of Beaumont, Texas. Um, currently, we're focused on improving health and education 
for kids and, and longevity, especially as we age, trying to make, remain, maintain that functional fitness. Uh, so yeah. many people, unfortunately, you retire, you've waited all these years to do so many things, and then you're physically handicapped. You, you're pretty much in prison and can't do those things you've been waiting to do because yeah. as we age, we slowly lose strength and deteriorate. However, that can be offset by just being consistent with your workout. Don't even have to do very much to maintain. And so um, really focusing on that, um, the, the impact to the brain, uh, brain derived neurotropic factor that's released in the brain when you exercise, which can help to prevent Alzheimer's, uh, reduce it, uh, improve long term memory, enhance learning. Uh, there's just so much that we could talk yeah. about and all those things. But uh, the, the number one way to increase, for instance, BDNF and to improve longevity to remain young is exercise um, and especially strength building. Um, the endurance and everything is super important as well. But what we have found and discovered through scientific studies and all is, is uh, the strength building aspect of it because you are losing muscle mass as you age. We all face sarcopenia and natural loss of muscle. And the only way yeah. to offset it is resistance training. Hey, so uh, as you mentioned earlier, I remember after uh, my head injury coming back from all that, my first running event back was the Pleasure Island 10K. And for me at that time in my life, a 10K was long distance running. For me, and, a 5K is. Yeah. And uh, a funny story about it was, you know, I was coming into the finish line and <laughs> I was trying to go in the back way. <laughs> so like everybody kept saying like, no, go around, go oh, around. Oh, that was you? <laughs> yeah, that was me. <laughs> and I was like, I like went down into the ditch and went around yes. the hole and I tried to come back through and like, no, you got to go. And I was like, what? <laughs> so yeah, that was me, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> but uh so now as you mentioned earlier you competitively compete in everything from cycling running triathlons crossfit and powerlifting so let's start at the beginning regarding all these events what is your progression meaning competitively in which sport did you begin i began in the traditional sports you know basketball all, all those types of things that, that kids play soccer etc and then moved on uh, once i graduated from college uh, college is where I ran my first uh, 5K okay. uh, was when I was in college and didn't know anything about distance running at the time. <laughs> yeah. uh, just some friends were like, hey, we're going over to I went to Louisiana Tech University in Ruston. So Monroe was 30 minutes away. Yeah. They woke me up in the morning and said, hey, come run this 5K with us. I didn't even know how far a 5K was. I mean, I'm an engineer <laughs> yeah. and all, so I could figure it out pretty quickly. But I was, <laughs> we get there. And so we take off. I have no idea about pacing. Yeah. All we know is that you know, as young athletes having played other sports and, and I did run track. Uh, yeah. The 400 was my longest distance. And I thought oh, wow. that was, and <laughs> yeah. I thought that was a marathon distance at the time. <laughs> yeah. the, the, the 400 was the longest distance I ran, but so running the 5k, we take off my buddy and I, and when we passed the first mile marker, we thought they said 11 minutes. They said uh -huh. seven minutes. So we thinking, oh, we're going so slow. We yeah. picked the pace up <laughs> for the second mile. And then by the third mile, had to stop and walk some. So <laughs> quite a learning experience. <laughs> we make the next one. It's like, I don't know, it was 13 minutes or something. And we're yeah. like, how oh, do you go? That wasn't a two minute mile. <laughs> but, yeah. So that was my first step into running longer distance. But yeah, what got me into a lot of the other sports was uh, whenever I hosted events, I wanted the athlete's perspective. So I always okay. competed in whatever I was going to host. Um, yeah. So I was speed skating. And the way I got into that was I had written my book series. And I thought about, oh, I had this great idea. I'll skate across the United States and teach about reading and wow. education and the importance of exercise. Because I've always lifted weights ever since I was young. Yeah. Um, my grandfather did, and I always looked up to him. He was so strong when even even when he was in his 80s and everything. And so wow. um, that that kind of molded me in that respect. And then, of course, you watch Rocky and, and uh, <laughs> yeah. Pumping Iron and all those back in the day. And <laughs> you're yeah. motivated. But um, when it came to speed skating, I always loved 
speed skating in the Olympics as a kid. And then I was like, oh, I'll skate across that. I thought to myself, I really don't know how to skate that well. When am I do <laughs> I get to mountains or hills? I'm in a lot of trouble. And so yeah. I called up the largest manufacturer of speed skates, Bond, over in Australia. And the owner of the company actually spoke with me, told me, go to Houston there's, and, and they'll help you. So they, I went over there and it was uh, Chad Hedrick's uh, parents' uh, place. Oh, okay. And Chad Hedrick won several gold medals. Uh, yeah. A few Olympics ago um, in speed skating is most decorated inline speed skater in the world of all time. But um, whenever I went to sk- over there, it was me and a bunch of little kids in the little class to learn to yeah. skate. And then they say, you want to stick around and watch the team? And I go, team, I don't know what you're talking about. And then all these athletes come in and I was just, wow. And that, that was my start of my process into the sport. And I started competing. Okay. But then, uh, I was skating and my friend Ray Lisa at Star Sports Society with, he was doing triathlons. He said, you okay. do a triathlon. And the problem for me was I couldn't swim at the time. <laughs> so <laughs> that was my challenge. Yeah. He said, if you do a triathlon, I'll do a speed skating race. So okay. I finally taught myself with a lot of swallowing the pool, how to swim. <laughs> yeah. And competed in a triathlon and then went on to do quite a few triathlons. But, um, after competing in the first one, he went to watch me speed skate, and he was like, "Oh heck no, I'm not doing that." So he didn't hold up the end of his bargain. But um, and then both Ray and I got were cycling and racing, got into cycling races, and and you know duathlons yeah. and mountain biking, and you just name it from there. Um, adventure races, did yeah. some of those. Uh, then of course did five Ks, half marathons. Marathon became a marathon maniac. Met the requirements for that. Uh, ultra um so yeah just uh that was the progression basically okay and then after running i did have uh, uh some achilles tendonitis issues that really yeah. was aggravating me and a little bit of problem um in my leg as well so i stepped away for a little bit and when i came back to it, i started back into strength training and then started yeah. um i worked with mike denman over at mauriceville with his kids because micah helped us with our iron games yeah competition that we put on and he just trains all these kids and helps them in high school great guy it's amazing what he does with them and so that was my step into powerlifting and and uh, that's what oh, i currently okay. compete in is is the powerlifting yeah and then still dabble in crossfit and uh that's where we are currently heck yeah let me uh go back a little bit and i have a few questions about cycling and triathlons here for sure. you so I know that each event has its own challenges and each athlete has different athletic abilities and levels. But in your opinion, which sport is more challenging when it comes to cycling versus running? Uh, You answer that question. They each have their own challenges. Uh, Personally, for me, the cycling was where I excelled the most. Um, Okay. It depends on your background and how many years of experience you have in each. Okay. Um, your VO2 max, your your muscle strength. Uh, if you have a lot of leg power, cycling is really advantageous to you because um, you can generate more power without having to have necessarily the, the VO2 capability. Um, okay. You can also be a slight bit heavier on the bike than you can running because the lighter you are, obviously, with the running, the more the more to your advantage. Um, so for but again, it's it's a personal thing. Some people are very efficient, very good runners, and so the running. They're more yeah. tuned to. Um, honestly, when it comes to triathlons, what I found is your best runners end up being your best triathletes. Oh, okay. Um, as long as you're decent at the bike, I mean, you can't be horrible at the other two <laughs> disciplines, yeah. but you could be the weakest at the swimming, yeah, and best at the running, and you'll probably have a better overall time than someone that's better at swimming than they are at the other two. So, as you recall, um, at the beginning of the whole covid epidemic i started taking the steps to training for a triathlon uh i was speaking with you in april about that and literally right. two weeks into it covid happened and it just sidelined that whole idea and everything so my knowledge on triathlon is very minimal but i've got to imagine that with the few weeks of lap swimming that i did in a closed pool it's got to be way different than swimming in open water with all the other contestants, right? It, it is. It's very, I mean, I try to get on the outside. I'm not a very good swimmer, so that's not my strong point. I'll even sometimes just fade to the back a little bit because I know I'm not going to win the swim. So 
by get beat up, <laughs> crawled over, goggles yeah. swiped off your face, punched. You know, it all happens because you're all like right on top of each other, yeah. turning, turning up the water. Um, so I just sit back a little bit, maybe catch a little draft if I can, uh, a little faster swimmer and, and, and try and stay in there. But um, for what I found with triathlons, you have limited time. So you really can't train for all three at optimal level. So it's best to pick two. So I picked the two that I'm better at, which was the cycling and the running, and invested okay. my time there. And I would just try to survive the swim and then make up the time on the bike and then running. Okay. Uh, was my approach. But, yeah, as far as the open water swimming goes, uh, being able <laughs> to spot, you know, yeah. find something on the land straight ahead so you don't veer off course and end up swimming an extra – your you know extra 100 yards to who knows yeah. how far is very important um there's it, also no nothing to grab onto yeah I mean, you're out there so there's no like bail out i mean you're you're invested once you get out there they do have some lifeguards and boats and everything but uh it's not like the pool where you can just oh get to the side or you know yeah. stop so you really need to learn your pace learn to breathe efficiently learn to spot right. um don't get off course all that type of stuff so let's transition into running. With everything that you do as an athlete, has running ever been the primary focus? Yes, um, it has. And I progressively got better at it. Yeah. I've never been a terrible runner, um, except when I was a little kid. <laughs> but by about six <laughs> days for some reason, I started running okay and then uh, – uh, made improvements and always have been an okay runner. I'm not, not an elite runner by any stretch of the imagination, but, um, <laughs> you know, hour and a half, half marathon, three yeah. and a half hour marathon type of thing, you know, best five yeah. day was right at just around 19, slightly under 19 minutes. Um, Heck yeah, but, uh, no, nothing to, you know, go anywhere with, but an okay time. But as far as the running went, uh, my efficiency improved, but what I found was I overtrained in running. Toward the end, I got better at it, but I would follow different programs like everyone and yeah. put in these long, long miles. Yep. And then I would find myself at a point where I get a little better, and then all of a sudden it became more of a struggle. And my times would slow down. I would lose strength um, because you're eating away muscle mass, not recovering enough, maybe not fueling enough. Yeah, There's too much time on the road. And actually, for the last marathon I ran, I only ran twice before the marathon. I put in some time on the bike. Yeah. And I ran an eight mile run and an 11 mile run. <laughs> ran the marathon and was only three minutes behind the best time I had ever run. Oh, but wow. I, went in, I was fresh. I wasn't injured. I did yeah. really well. Now, that's not to say you can do that if you've never run a marathon. You have right. to at least have run the distance before. So your central nervous system and your body knows it. Um, yeah. So you do have to at some point log those miles, but maybe not do as many 20 plus mile runs as they say, you know, cut back what I, and this is my opinion somewhat, but if I look at the elite runners, yeah, we go, Oh, so-and-so from Kenya, he went out and ran 13 miles. I go, yeah, he ran for an hour. You went out and ran for two hours plus yeah. to run the same distance. He only put in an hour of effort. So what we need to do to simulate that is go out and put in an hour of effort. Just pick your pace up. And to okay. me, that seems to have much better results. Yeah. Than to go out there and go, okay, this guy ran 20 miles. So I'm going to run 20 miles. Yeah, that guy ran 20 miles. He was only okay. out there for two hours. You were out there for days. And now <laughs> you, you've depleted your body of all your glucose. You know, your glycogen stores are gone. You're dehydrated. You're going to spend an entire week recovering. He's going to go out yeah. and run again tomorrow. You, you know, so it's, it's, I think we get caught up in elite programs and trying yeah. to match what they're doing. Whereas I'm not elite. I can't run as fast. I can't run a four and a half to five minute mile pace and, and match yeah. the time that he's putting in there. So I, I learned to adjust that. And I think I started to do a lot better with my So recovery. you said something. And it, it's a perfect segue into what I'm currently dealing with, rest days. Can you speak to how important these are? Because I feel that I have overtrained and I just never really did allow my body to recover adequately. Can you speak yes. to the importance of these? I can because I'm 
I'm guilty of that as well. <laughs> Not taking enough rest days. And even when people told me you need to rest, I wouldn't listen because I felt like in my mind, I was like, I have to go out and train. That's how I'm going yes. to get better. When we all know, because we've all read that you really improve while you're resting, give your body time to recover, yeah. and muscles to regenerate and everything. I actually, when I was running uh, at my height, at one point, I got in the worst shape of my life. Um, mm. I currently can bench press, you know, 320, 340 pounds. At that point, I could barely bench press 185 pounds for one rep. So I, I had I'm worn saying- myself down that much with the running. And yeah. just I actually put on some body weight, you know, a little bit of fat. I mean, I was just tearing myself down because I was constantly out there and I was actually damaging my body. So, um, the way to do that is to, as I've gotten older, now I listen to my body. And what I always like to say is I leave a few reps in the tank. So if I'm out there running Ooh, and nice. I go, hey, I could run another mile, but don't just stop there. You've already had a great workout. That extra yeah. mile is now going to put you in a state to where you can't recover in the next day or two versus if you stop now, you're going to recover in a day and can be back out there getting in some more quality miles because it's all about quality miles, quality reps versus just time on your feet. Because if you okay. want time on your feet, go and walk and get those miles in that way because you can recover from that and go back out. Don't go out there yeah. and just hammer yourself into the ground. And, and then th- the next workout's not going to be quality. You're, you're struggling to get through it. And what are you improving? You're just showing people that I can suffer. I can endure pain. <laughs> but I'm not getting faster. I'm not getting stronger. Um, you know, I think you perfectly just uh, recapped my last year. And because that's how I was. I was just hammering in the miles and just like, it was just right. always go, go, go with me. And I think I really did wear my body out and uh, I'm, I'm paying for it now, but it's uh, a lesson learned the hard way. I agree. I think that a lot of people set themselves up for injury when they get to that point, because then yes, once you're depleted and worn out and you, and that's why I'm always so big on strength training. Um, Cause once you put yourself in a state of weakness, now yeah. you lose your form and so you're not running yes. with proper form. So now you start leaning to one side, you start dragging something, you start not moving correctly. And then that puts too much pressure on a ligament, a tendon. And before you know it, you've torn something, you've got, you know, yeah. cramps, you, anything can happen. Yeah. Man, I remember one time uh, I came to you with the injury and it was my, my forearm. And I was like, oh, nothing. I mean, I was fine and everything, but come to find out I was letting my form go and my hands were doing the floppy thing and right. well, it was compensating and just, yeah. So, I mean, injuries can happen anywhere on your body because your form goes during the right. Run. And, and then we just, we're just like, ah, I'll deal with it afterwards. <laughs> so yeah, I don't, don't pay the price later. Just fix yourself. <laughs> right. Exactly. So Richard, I, I'm going to read something to you and you give us the backstory on this. Setbacks happen to everyone. Do not let a setback become an excuse for derailing your fitness and your health. I've had numerous setbacks from almost having my leg amputated to crushing my face. I am running a 5k three days after being involved in a bike crash and face planting into a pothole. Yes, I am in pain and I had to reduce my workout intensity and frequency, but that does not mean that I'm stopping. Can you speak to this event? Sure. Uh, I was cycling and the guy, well, Eric Lang, he's here local. He knows the story. <laughs> no fault of his own. His bicycle pedal snapped off his bike and I was right behind him. So he crashed and I was okay. right behind him. So I flipped over the top of him. Typically, you know, a bicycle crash to get some road rash. I just bad fortune uh, yeah. landed with my face straight into the edge of a pothole. So Ooh. it exploded my entire upper yeah. jaw. Um, these are all fake teeth now. Um, I lost six teeth. They had to do a bone graft, rebuild my upper jaw. They didn't know if they could. Um, I had to have plastic surgery because it tore away my lip, my cheek. And wow. It was pretty bad lacerations. It, it was uh, years of recovery. I had to have all sorts of orthodontic work, oral surgery, et cetera, to overcome it. You know, and I, I bring this up because this encompasses your spirit. So you obviously didn't quit and you didn't let it sideline you, but I'm going to follow up with what you finished in your statement. You continue to push through with whatever you can do to maintain your health 
accelerate your healing, improve your quality of life and functionality. When you get knocked down, get back up, keep stepping forward, fight. No excuses. So Richard, the reason I bring that up is because you have no idea how much that post alone just motivated me. Uh, as oh, you know, you. oh yeah, definitely. As you know, uh, I'm rehabbing from this Achilles tendon surgery and everything, but I'm constantly finding new ways to keep my training going in some way. H hindsight is 2020, doing it the smart way now. <laughs> yeah. But of course, through our conversation, both present and past conversation, you're always the one who is always pushing me to do better and everything. And it's something that I honestly and thoroughly appreciate. So thank you for that. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, yeah, definitely. That motivates me as well. <laughs> keep, keep moving forward. Heck yeah. Hey, but since we're talking about running, can you speak with your experiences on trail running real quick? Did you ever DNF anything? What is your longest one? And did you ever get lost on the trail anywhere? That's a, I do have a story about getting <laughs> lost. I was running an ultra in Alexandria, Louisiana. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty funny. Um, so... Uh, that slow down part i hadn't quite learned yet uh, i took off with the elite pack and they're running a high five minute mile pace low six minute mile pace a couple of miles into a run and i'm thinking i can't even maintain this for a 5k what the heck am i doing <laughs> but it was 20 something degrees outside so it was cold yeah and, uh, you know you felt go you're getting warm staying warm that way and it's easier to run on those really cold days so yeah. I slowed down and backed off the pace. So I ended up in no man's land. But it was <laughs> one of those ultras, you know, through the wilderness where it's, they tell you ahead of time, be prepared. It's not well marked. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, the way the terrain is out there, it's where it's leaves foliage cover the ground. So oh, everything yeah. is the same. There's no discernible trail, really. You just had to look for arrows on trees uh, from time to time. Well, I'm running along and because of the leaves, I stepped on a stick and rolled my ankle and I, I yelped kind of a high pitch feminine <laughs> sound. <I'll admit. laughs> and so a few minutes later, I catch up to another runner in front of me and he said, did you hear a girl scream? I was like, nope, <laughs> I haven't seen anyone. <laughs> and so I, uh, he says, well, I live near here. I'm out here all the time. I run all the, all the time. Yeah, well, I've always told myself, know where you're going. You're responsible for where you're going this time because I was trying to get my ankle back together and run. I said, oh, he knows the area. He's run this so many times and I just relax and say, I'll just stick with him for a little bit and let him be my guide. And sure enough, after a couple of miles or I don't, I don't know quite how far it was, we came across a side sign that said naval bombing area. <laughs> and I was like. I'm pretty much sure he goes, I think we missed a turn. I go, yeah, I think we did. I don't think they routed us through a bombing site. Yeah. And so we were off course. We ended up getting to a highway and being taken back to the last water stop. Um, actually, oh, wow. didn't have water stops. this was very rugged. You just, they had some bottles thrown on the ground. Oh, there, man. But it was a checkpoint. Um, <laughs> And so we had to resume the run from there. So that's my get lost. <laughs> oh, <laughs> man. Um, I have missed some turns and some triathlons, but you know instantly um, that you yeah. missed it and you circle back around. That's the biggest loss I've ever gotten in, in, in a race uh, okay. was was that one. Um, so that's that's my loss. Uh, a DNF, <laughs> no, I did cramp up, full body cramp right before the finish line after an adventure race and rolled through the finish line. Oh, um, wow then laid on the ground with the paramedics around me for about 30 minutes trying to shove electrolytes in me. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, I try to think I, I might've had a DNF in a cycling race because of a crash yeah. or a bicycle breaking down. I'm pretty sure I did. It's been a while. I have one DNF in speed skating because of a crash that broke my ankle. Um, Ooh. but yeah, that's, I, I, on a running event, I can't think of any race where I had a DNF because with running, you can always walk. Yeah. So unless yeah. you completely roll an ankle or do something or get hit by a car that wanders onto a course or something, you can, <laughs> you can typically finish um, even in a state of pure cramping and pain because we've yeah. all been there. You oh, just yeah. end up taking a long <laughs> time uh, to do it. So, hey, Richard, I have this question. In your opinion, what exercises can we – the whole running community 
focus on to improve our overall running posture, strength, and endurance? I'd say squatting is number one. Squatting. Doing squats, weight bearing squats, um, you know, barbell squats. It's a full body exercise. I think deadlifting is also good. Um, those are both, they'll incorporate all your muscles. Um, then of course there's always yoke walks and, uh, I prefer exercises that are compound movements for a lot of runners. What they don't realize is that if you're stronger, then you, it's easier to maintain your posture, which yes. allows you to breathe more easily. And this, this is more when you get later into the race and you're fatigued and your shoulders slump forward, then you bend over, then you're compressing your diaphragm and you can't get a full breath and everything becomes a struggle. And then like you talked about with your arms, you can't hold your arms up and, uh, I was able, because I lifted and everything, I always carried a water bottle with me and never had any trouble carrying it. Yeah. So it gives you little extra advantages such as that. But um, yes, I, I think strengthening your legs, uh, the muscles in them, you're not going to become bulky. Uh, everyone is under that <laughs> yeah. misconception. You can lift your entire, you can lift a lot of weight and you will not become bulky. It takes a lot of eating and you're going to burn too many calories with running for that ever to become an issue. So um yeah, you just increase your strength. Your muscles become more. It also improves the strength of your ligaments and tendons, which is extremely vital. So beyond the muscle, it's that ligament and tendon strength because uh, your the repetitiveness of running and other yeah. sports such as that wears on them. Well, that is some great advice, and I definitely think that the whole, entire running community can benefit from that advice right there because I know that is the advice that you had given me when I first started my running career. So right. thank you. And you'll notice even the elite runners do lift um, weights yeah. nowadays. Hey, so Richard, now your main focus is powerlifting. So I'm going yes. to ask you a few true or false questions to kickstart this section off. True or false, you have won powerlifting state championships. True. True or false, you have won powerlifting national championships. True. True or false, you have set three powerlifting world records. True. Dude, this is all just so amazing. <laughs> Go ahead and uh, tell us some of this stuff. <laughs> well, and, and it's all based on, I mean, I'm not the strongest person in the world, but just like with running, they have age categories. So every five years. Yeah. And so now I'm a master's athlete. So that does reduce, you know, attrition through the year. So the competition's not, you know, as many people. Um, as you get older, so that is an advantage. Um, and then of course, body weight, unlike running, okay. you take body weight into uh, consideration. So if you, I did it in the 165 pound class. So you had to weigh right under 165 pounds um, down to, I think it's 140 some, 148 pounds maybe um, yeah. in that range. I've also competed in the next weight class up, which is 165 to 181. So I've competed in both of those weight classes. So the records are assigned to the weight and age oh, okay. um, where I set the, the world records. Uh, they have an open division, which is any age, anybody, any, and those, those numbers are much heavier than, than what I have lifted. <laughs> <laughs> so for those of us that don't know how this works, can you walk us through the process of being invited to a powerlifting competition? Like how does that uh, anyway process work? It's just like a run. There are powerlifting competitions all over the place. You just pay your entry fee, and okay. then you have to pay to join the federation. If it's USA Powerlifting, then you just pay a fee for that federation, uh, which okay. is, gives you a one-year license to compete in any of their events being set, hosted anywhere. But um, the only ones you have to qualify for, like Mr. Olympia or um, Arnold competition or some national-level competitions, but okay. they have – competitions happening in almost every city um okay. mike denman hosts one in orange every year they have one in august here in beaumont um annually but uh you sign up you have to wear a singlet um there are some okay. rules as to what you can and cannot do with the lift um as far oh. as form goes okay but it's uh they have squat bench and deadlift or the three movements you can do just one of them you can just sign up to do bench press you can do push pull as they call it, which you would do the bench press and the deadlift, or you can do full power, which is, uh, you know, all three that you compete in. Okay. Um, you can set records in each individual event, as well as your overall total comprised of all three events. Wow. So there, there are quite a few areas. And of course, win medals, you just like with running, if you, if your total yeah. 
beats others. Um, they have different divisions where you can wear knee wraps, you can wear suits. Uh, April's an equipped lifter. She can speak much more <laughs> about that. <laughs> um, I'm what they call raw lifter. So I just have the, it's like, it's like a wrestling singlet um, okay. that you wear. So there's no extra equipment involved. Um, you yeah. can wear a weight belt when you do the squatting. But um, yeah, that's about it. And you just go in, you have three attempts. And it's your best lift of those three attempts. Okay. If you happen to miss all three, you're out of the competition. So you always open with something that you believe you can get. Yeah. Sound and go for broke in the next two. It, okay. It's strategic as to how you approach it. But um, yeah, that's that's it. So what is the largest powerlifting event that you've got to compete in? Uh, the Mr. Olympia this year. Mr. Olympia has a powerlifting event. Okay. Um, I have done the national championships that were held in Ohio. Um, it was a fantastic event in Columbus, Ohio. Um, that was exciting. Um, but yeah, the Mr. Olympia competition, which is where Mr. Olympia is crowned, the bodybuilding, the famous bodybuilding competition. Um, oh, wow. I competed in the powerlifting division. But uh, yeah, it was a phenomenal event. That's the largest event I've been to. So currently, what do you deadlift weight wise? Um, on the platform and competition, the most I've done is 551 pounds. Oh my God. <laughs> and current squat? Uh, somewhere uh, in competition, 463 pounds. But in, the, in the gym, it's a little bit more, but I'm okay. giving competition numbers. Okay. So <laughs> in, in the gym, what can you get? Um, I've actually, in my lifetime, I've squatted 500 pounds at my most. Um, oh, wow. Deadlift, about 565. And then bench press about 340 pounds. Oh, dude. So what events are you currently training for? Um, I'm training for another powerlifting competition in all three, squat, bench, and deadlift. Um, so hoping to have some goals. I'd like to be able to deadlift 600 pounds, um, squat again 500 pounds, bench press. I mean, I'd love to one day say I could do 405 pounds, but I'll be happy to get 350, 365, somewhere in there. Yeah. Uh, so we, we'll see where it all leads to. Uh, like I said, I'm still making incremental gains. So I'm thrilled with that. And we'll just see yeah. where it takes us. All right. So that's all the questions that I have for you. Is there anything you want to go back, revisit, or add before we move on to the next section? I think you covered it all. My thing is, just like the theme we keep speaking to, uh, it's never too late to start. It's more important that you do it as you get older. I mean, your body's very forgiving and can recover a lot when you're younger, less so once you become older. We don't become a feeble elderly person overnight. We've all seen the elderly people in our lives and just out in society, and we know it's coming, but we can take steps to avoid the worst case. I mean, none yeah. of us are... are guarantee that we won't have a stroke or something happen right you know, cancer there's so many things that are not fault of anyone but as far as becoming weak and not able to function in in your daily life that is avoidable so yes functional fitness there you go that's the word <laughs> i was looking for <laughs> all right richard hey here's a few warm-up questions before we jump into the five to stay alive so regarding the adventures of the elements, which character do you most identify with? I actually named the characters after my brothers and sisters, the kids. Oh, yeah? So I'm in the book. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I identify the most with myself. <laughs> okay. That is, that is awesome. I love this, man. So the kids that find the sunglasses to where they can see the elements are my brothers and sisters. And, okay. Uh, and myself. Trust that I'm picking up this series already. <laughs> hey, so throughout this conversation, we've learned a lot about you and your accomplishments. Whether it's running, triathlons, or powerlifting, can you explain that feeling of hitting the pinnacle and accomplishing the goals that you've set out for yourself? Uh, it's, and that's a, a very good question because we all, even if you won the Super Bowl, you start thinking about what about the next one? So just with your goals, it's like, oh, I did it. I finally hit this, but. I can do a little better or you're already looking forward to, Hey, I've got this next goal I want to do. So, you know, as humans, we're never truly satisfied. I guess in a sense, um, that's what keeps us motivated and moving forward on the positive side, because then here's the next goal. You just don't hang up your spurs and sit down. It's not over. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So you're always, I'm always elated, but I guess I never try to be too high or too low in any regard, just kind of yeah. stay steady. 
And uh, hey, we did it. Enjoy the moment. But let's move and get ready to go after that next goal. There you go. And uh, the last warm up question that I have with everything on your agenda, how do you find time to continuously train and improve your athletic abilities? Again, less is more. So through the years, I've learned to do less, but make it quality over quantity. Um, the other thing is just do it. Uh, even if you spend an hour working out for that day, it's a fraction of your day. So you yeah. can get a great workout in in 15 to 20 minutes if that's all you have. So it's just a matter of, of getting it done. I always tell people if you go to a gym, if that's where you work out, or if you're going for, for a run just on the road, just have your clothes with you. Then yeah. whenever the opportunity arises, you know, I have to go home, get my stuff, then go over. Then it becomes an entire ordeal. But if you can just walk out of wherever you are or yeah. if you're driving home and you go past the gym and it's right there, you can just hop in and get it done, then it's more likely to happen. So I say just set yourself up for success by being making it as convenient as possible. There just you go. Taking over any opportunity. Heck yeah. And now it's time for the five to stay alive. These are the questions that I ask every guest about themselves and what keeps them going. I feel like I'm on a game show. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> Contestant Richard, are you ready to answer the five to stay alive? As long as I can really stay alive with it. <laughs> <laughs> Question number one, do you run with or without music? And if so, what is one power song on your playlist that motivates you? I do both, but yes, I, when I run with music, I like upbeat, I guess harder music in a sense. But I, one that I've always liked, even since I was a kid, is Eye of the Tiger. Oh, there <laughs> you go. I, I love it. So keep in mind that this song will be added to the Spotify guest playlist for listeners to download, and this song is a representation of you. Everyone out there in podcast land, you can go to the Run Tree Diary Spotify page and download the guest playlist. It is updated after my guests add their songs and contains the songs that keeps them motivated. Question number two. What are some things in your life that have positively changed since you've started running? I would say my ability to pace myself better, okay. even in life. Because when you run a marathon, you can't, you have to control your pace. So you, you take your time, you, you know your thresholds, you don't make hasty decisions. Um, it's very you try to control the environment more so same in approaching real world situations and then of course uh, with all endurance sports running cycling whatever it may be it's just that time to clear your mind to have great thoughts about problem solving opportunities it yes just causes because you have all you, you listed all those good hormones in your body through exercise through running and it's it just stimulates the brain all that brain-derived neurotrophic factor is being formed and it's really a great time to learn and, and to problem solve. There you go. Question number three. In your opinion, what is one thing that an athlete should avoid in their journey to becoming a better runner? Uh, avoid getting tra sucked up into, I have to do this pace because so-and-so is doing it or these, these people run this fast. Everyone's different. Some people are just genetically gifted. We accept in the classroom that Joe over there is super smart. He doesn't have to study, he passes all his tests. He has a photographic memory. Well, some people are blessed when it comes to running. They're just genetically gifted. And no matter how hard you train, you will never beat them or be able to emulate them. They may have a superior VO2 max. Um, you know, the way the body circulates waste product and removes it, you know, the way their muscles are anchored to, to their uh, bone structure, the number of fi muscle fibers they may have puts them at a genetically gifted uh, level. So don't go, just because so-and-so can run a five-minute mile, I should be able to do it. No, you may physically never be able to do it. Just run within what you can and you look to make improvements on what you're currently doing. Because we can all improve and get better. It's just right. don't look at someone else and go, that Olympic athlete can do this or that elite runner over there can do that. No, this is what Richard can do. And there you go. I'll try and prove that by uh, some amount. Question number four, finish this statement. When it comes to long distance running, Richard cannot leave the house without his? For me, it's my fuel because fuel. I'm one of those people that sweats a lot and ends up cramping. If, I, if my electrolytes get out of balance or don't have enough sodium intake, um, that type of thing. So I, I make sure I fuel every 
15 to 30 to 45 minutes for sure. Um, so I always have my water bottle, always have some type of goo or something with me uh, to make sure, especially on the longer runs, that I, I don't let those glycogen stores become completely depleted. Yeah, and especially down here in this Southeast Texas yes. heat. Oh my God. Yes. What, what do you use for fuel? Do you have a go-to or do you just go through whatever you have? I've, I've done several things through the years. Um, one that I've always loved is honey. <laughs> okay. And then, yes. And then uh, I, I've used pickle juice as well. Uh, anything with acetaminophen because that helps with the cramping. Yeah. Uh, just that level. But yeah, I love honey. I'm a big honey fan. But uh, yeah, I do a lot of the goo packets have good electrolytes in them and everything yeah. else. But various brands, I haven't just don't have one. Okay. I like certain flavors, such as the apple pie flavor or different ones. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Question number five. Do you have a running, workout, or a life mantra? Uh, get back up. Don't quit. Don't don't stop. Stay All with right. the consistency. All right. Thank you for answering the five to stay alive. Hey, Richard, is there anything that you want to add or go back and revisit before we close this episode out? Just I want more people, especially as we age, to get out there and, and do it. Don't be intimidated. We all start somewhere. We all have life setbacks, such as you right there with your uh, Luis's injury and recovery. Yeah. Um, so you do what you can because no matter what you do today, you can improve on it the next day. And if you keep showing up, you will make improvements. Every single person gets stronger. Uh, I have some people that come here to Fit Lab in their 60s and 70s that are the strongest they have ever been in their life because they have been consistently coming. And even at their um, older age, they're stronger than they were when they were younger. So you can get stronger and you can have better years e even as you age. There you go. Hey, Richard, I wanna thank you for being a guest on the show. Your journey has taught us to never be afraid to take those first steps towards accomplishing our goals. That setbacks are not failures, but rather ingredients for great success stories. And lastly, your journey encompasses and manifests what many of us fail to recognize. That the shortest route to achieving our athletic goals isn't the straight line, but rather consistency. And consistency is a good secret to good quality life. Again, Richard, thank you. And it was an honor to have you on the show. Thank you. Enjoyed uh, being here. Great right, job. Definitely. definitely. Hey, you have a good evening. And I'll see you all through the trails, buddy. Awesome. Take care. We're approaching the finish line, but before we cross, here's some news and views. That was Richard James III. And from setbacks to accomplishments, he has continually prevailed over his challenges while strengthening his education and his athletic talents. Through my years as an ultra runner, Richard has become one of my main sources of athletic guidance, health information, and support. And his advice that he gives us in this episode is beneficial to us all, regardless of our sport, occupation, or age. Let's recap, here's Richard. As I've gotten older, now I listen to my body. And what I always like to say is I leave a few reps in the tank. So if I'm out there running Ooh, and I nice. go, hey, I have to run another mile, but don't. Just stop there. You've already had a great workout. That extra yeah. mile is now going to put you in a state to where you can't recover in the next day or two. Versus if you stop now, you're going to recover in a day and you can be back out there getting in some more quality miles. Because it's all about quality miles, quality reps versus just time on your feet. No matter how fit you ever become, Life has setbacks, so don't get stuck on a number or I can run this fast or I can do this many miles because life may set you back. You just have to deal with wherever you are in your life at that moment. Run the mile you're in. Don't be intimidated. We all start somewhere. We all have life setbacks. So you do what you can because no matter what you do today, you can improve on it the next day. And if you keep showing up, you will make improvements. You can get stronger and you can have better years even as you age. As runners, when it comes to injury prevention, improving running economy, balance, and neuromuscular connections, strength training is of great importance. And showing up every day will get you to the door, but long-term consistency will open it and get us that functional fitness that will improve our everyday life. So again, Richard, thank you for your time and your advice. You already know you have our support. Keep moving, keep improving. Good luck on your next events, and I'll see you out there on the trails. Next, additions to the Spotify guest playlist. I was waiting for this one to be added and Richard finally did it. The 1982 classic made specifically for the Rocky III film, Eye of the Tiger by Survivor. And you can't have one without the other, so we just had to add Gonna Fly Now, AKA the Rocky theme, composed and conducted by Bill Conti. 
So there you go, two classic motivational songs to get out there and kick some ass to. And that brings the Spotify guest playlist to 17 songs. Download and enjoy. One last tidbit of information before we close out this episode. In running, there's room for everybody and everybody. We're grateful for the positive feedback we get regarding the messages we send with our podcast episodes. We truly hope you continue finding valuable information in these words. We'll continue doing our part to help the running community be an all-inclusive one. Thank you for your continued support. And with that, we have crossed the finish line. So if you have any questions, comments, concerns, or guest recommendations, contact me at runshoe.diaries at gmail.com. Again, that is runshoe.diaries at gmail.com. Be sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Keyword search, Runshoe Diaries. Thank you for listening to the Runshoe Diaries podcast, episode 12, with Richard James III. Until next time, remember that with each step, comes the decision to take another so keep putting one foot in front of the other because it's amazing what you can do on your own two feet and i'm out